Right, we come to this now. Should the media name those who have died from COVID-19? Well, Rebecca Davis wrote a thought-provoking piece questioning whether it's in the public interest to do so or not. Well, she joins us now via Skype to take this conversation even further. Rebecca, always a pleasure talking to you. Good morning to you. I mean, this is, is, is a very much necessary debate because on one hand, you have family members uh, who have, you know, rather lost loved ones uh, due to COVID-19 who may not necessarily become with having the names of their loved ones, uh, you know, sort of made public. I remember there was an incident, if you remember, Tulas, in the Western Cape region where it was previously reported that two um, had, you know, died from COVID-19 and that number being revoked by uh, the Minister of Health and saying actually it is one. One of the family members there not being comfortable with that name, uh, rather, of their deceased being mentioned in public. But that, that, that's definitely a debate that's been sparked up across newsrooms as well. That's right. And I think that incident that you mentioned is exactly the one that first got me thinking about this, because we had this situation where these two people in the Western Cape are named as having died of COVID-19. They were not named in terms of their identities being revealed, but it quickly circulated on WhatsApp and Facebook, as happens these days. And then there's this kind of outpouring of grief for this assumed victim of COVID-19, who then is revealed to not have died of COVID-19, to have died of other underlying health causes. And then there's this weird situation where, you know, people aren't quite sure if they should express relief that there isn't another COVID-19 victim, but also this woman is still dead, her family is still grieving. And I think that really showed some of the difficulties around this. So we're now in this situation where some people are saying, look, we, should, we need to be very careful of the sensitivities around this. The journalists working on these stories should only be naming people who die of COVID-19 if they have the express permission of the families involved. But one of the complicating issues there is that it is likely that certain kinds of families may be more likely to give permission to the media than others. Those who are more media savvy, maybe those who are more affluent. And so one unintended consequence could be that the only victims who are named become kind of wealthier, middle class people, which inadvertently perpetuates the sense that the only people dying of this in South Africa are wealthy travelers, which is already an existing myth that we've seen circulating in informal settlements, for instance. So there's a lot of kind of complexities that journalists have to consider in terms of both public health concerns and media ethics. Yeah, Rebecca, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you ask yourself, what is the overriding uh, public interest uh, that, that is served by naming someone who has died from COVID-19? Um, wh what is it that you are, you, you, you are trying to serve there? But at the same time, we as journalists are always trying to humanize the story, do we? Right. To say these are not just numbers, these are actual people with a story, with other people that cared for them and now have lost this, uh, this loved one. But you add to that the whole issue of stigma. Mm. That's, that's exactly the other point. And we learned from this all too well in the early days of the HIV pandemic. And the case that people are often citing at the moment is that of Gugu Dlamini. 1988 goes on a radio show, uh, says she is HIV positive and is murdered by her community, stoned to death. And the fear here is that there already is some indication that COVID-19 is being associated with stigma, not to the level of HIV, I think because it's not a sexually transmitted disease, but we are already seeing reports of people being shunned by the community, being shunned even by neighbors in affluent suburbs. So the fear is too that if you are naming people who have died of COVID-19, there is a real possibility that their remaining family members and those left behind could be subjected to harassment and bullying as well, because people assume that they've been in contact with them. And if you're putting people in danger in that, in that way, then you have to ask yourself, what is the public interest? And yeah. on that note, to tell us, one of the, the, the kind of solutions journalists have found, which is imperfect this time, has been to say, okay, let's name those people who are already sort of in the public eye. And one example was the HIV researcher, Dr. Jita Ramji, one of our earliest COVID-19 victims, who was well-known, kind of high profile. So to say, okay, maybe it's fair game to name those people. Mm. But this, again, potentially gives rise to this kind of not very desirable situation where it seems like the media is only naming important people right. and doesn't care about the other victims, which is also a real catch-22. You know, you want to yeah. say, 
okay, but the families won't give us permission, but at the same time, it seems you're only celebrating the lives of certain mm. people. It's interesting you mentioned that, uh, you know, Rebecca, because I know that there was also a debate on social media about the number of high-profile people that also came out, went to the Instagram lives and said that contracted uh, COVID-19, one of them being Idris Elba. We also saw with Tom Hanks, Zuelin Zimavavi, whom we've also had the, uh, you know, opportunity to have a conversation with about uh, this Tulas. But also people were saying, uh, Rebecca, under the same breath, that how do we know that you are perhaps not even paid to say this? Why is it that you're so free to come up? So it's sort of almost, it, it, it stirred up a, a mistrust of why are high profile people so comfortable in also just outing themselves and saying, hey, this is what we uh, have learned from our doctors. And perhaps they would be doing that, of course, to raise awareness on how real this issue is. But it seems to have mixed reactions, even on social media. Yeah, social media adds a whole other dimension to this. I think we should actually encourage high-profile, well-liked people to be upfront about testing positive for coronavirus because that is considered to be one of the ways in which stigma can be lowered. And people said in particular, someone like Tom Hanks, really well-liked figure, Idris Elba, as you said, that can only be a positive thing. But the other element of social media, of course, is that people are also saying, what does it matter if journalists aren't naming the deceased from COVID-19, if we're all getting that via WhatsApps, we're seeing it on Facebook anyway. Mm. And that also poses another problem in this age, which is, is it okay for journalists to just go along with it because it's already in the public domain, because it's on Facebook, because it's on WhatsApp? And I think the answer has to be, well, not necessarily. That isn't a sufficient justification for us to then bring it onto a formal platform. All right, Rebecca, thought-provoking piece. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to see you. Uh, keep safe. Rebecca Davis there talking to us about a piece that she wrote. It's thought-provoking. I mean, it's new waters for all of us, whether we're yeah. journalists or in the areas of law. I mean, you speak about uh, prominent people coming out and confirming that they've tested positive. Mm. Did, did you see the video of uh, Ndaba Mandela?